Welcome to Bow Ties Are Sometimes Cool with myself, Ashley, and Ed. Hello, Ed. Hi, Ash. Hi, Ash. How are you? Very good, thank you. Very good. So this week we are going to talk about... Piers Brosnan. Bond. James Bond. Correct. And perhaps the title of the podcast might have given it away. Second time lucky. Uh, chosen because this was uh, when we look at Piers Brosnan and his first outing, Golden Eye, it was actually his second stab at the role. So the first time it was cast back in the 80s, Piers Brosnan actually first came to the attention of Kirby Broccoli in, during For Your Eyes Only, um, when they were filming that, because his wife at the time, Cassandra Harris, uh, was in there as Contessa, or Countessa, how would you say it? Contessa? Countess? Contessa, I would think, yes. I'm the Countess Liesel von Schlaff. My name is Bond. That's how he came to their attention. And uh, Piers Boston was actually doing Remington Steel as well, um, just before he was, well, auditioned and cast. Um, but I suppose if you're, in a way, it was kind of a bit of a James Bond type role, I guess, wasn't it really? sort of a... um, I've got vague memories of it sort of being on daytime telly. It was sort of like a sub Columbo type American t- sort of drama thing. But... I haven't got much of a memory about it, apart from I knew who Piers Brosnan was because of that programme. Well, as I say, the, it, enormous in the States. We do show Remington Steel here. It tends to go out a bit at strange times, so maybe that would be the reason well, why it hasn't grabbed the imagination of the public here in the same way as America, do you think? I don't think it, it is going out, is it? Actually, I think the BBC took it off. As far as I know they did. Well, that's what I heard. I heard it was on again and off again, actually. They put it on on Tuesday night at 7, and then they put it on Wednesday night at 11. Listen, there's, so, yes, there's no need for you to turn nasty with me. <laughs> I don't make these decisions. I, I know I you don't. tell them I, to take I, the things I, off. I know you don't, but that's what I heard the other day, that it's no longer on. Now, the thing was, that particular, that show actually got got dropped um, by, the t- by the company, the actual, um, that made it, the studio. Um, but it was like... I think it was contracted to run for another three series, but it was actually dropped due to poor ratings. And then as soon as Piers Brosnan was cast as Bond, um, they decided, oh, hang on, we'll, we'll, we'll actually revive the programme and we can have Bond as Remington Steel as well, which will be fantastic for the network. Um, but Kevin Broccoli was not having any of that. He was, uh, not, Bond will not be Remington Steel as well. So, sorry. We'll get someone else. But never mind that. But the final question is a rather worrying one for me because I've made it perfectly clear to old Cubby, hi Cubs, um. that I am available for the James Bond thing. And now, <laughs> now I understand that you are the front runner. I don't know anything about that. Now don't it's, start. It's, don't start. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's oh, that's a wicked rumor, really. I mean, that's quite something. It's it's fabrication by the press back there yeah. in the U.S. I mean, it's. Uh, Have you never been? Has Cobby not sidled <coughs> up to you at a party and said, "Hey, kid, Cobby hasn't you like to be anything James of the sort." No. 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 Well, I shall peruse and indeed pursue the matter further because we hope to have uh, the present incumbent. Roger Moore along with us very shortly, Mm -hmm. and I shall find out, and we'll probably get a picture of you and throw darts into it. Good, I'm sure you know better. (laughs) But in the meantime, it's great to see you. Thank Thank you. you. Yeah, Piers Brosnan was definitely the man for the job. I remember it was in the papers and everything, because I actually vividly remember that my dad gave me a little newspaper cutting, and I put it, (laughs) really sad, I put it in my wallet, you know, like, as if it was almost my photo. <laughs> that was me, though. But I just remember having it, and it was Piers Brosnan. So that was very confusing when I subsequently saw the film, and it was Timothy Dalton. Like, couldn't get my head around that. That's like you know, it's like, can you imagine someone saying this is the new Doctor Who, and then suddenly when it's televised, it's a different one. It'd be like, hey, uh. <laughs> oh, there's a, that's a story for another for another time when um, a certain actor was cast as a Doctor and someone else was meant to be it, but. We'll come, we'll come to that another time. But from what you're saying there, just going on the back of that then, so it sounds to me like the Bond gig is a golden handcuffs gig. It's like if you're Bond, you're Bond, and you can't be in anything else without the studio's express permission or depending on how your contract's written. 
Yeah, I believe so. I mean, I think there's been some things in the past which have been rumoured to be written into contracts. I think there was... Um, with Pierce Brosnan, I mean, he did do other films as well. I, so I don't think it was maybe that exclusive. I think what they were just not wanting, they, were, they weren't wanting to have the new Bond, or certainly the first film of a new Bond coming out, and him being really well known for something else simultaneously. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I think it, it's rumoured that he was written into his contract that he wasn't, if he wasn't going to do anything else, he wasn't allowed to wear a tuxedo. But that was just a rumour. But you yeah. can see oh. what you don't, you know, you don't kind of want to, you don't want those parallels drawn. You just want Bond to be, if you want, yeah, Pierce Brosnan, they... then and you want to see Bond, Pierce Brosnan as Bond, you, you come and see a Bond film, nothing else. Yeah, I suppose they didn't want him to use Bond, the other company to use his Bond status to make their product better. Yeah, for his own. Um, but yeah, GoldenEye was fantastic. I, I remember GoldenEye vividly. I went to the cinema to watch it. I didn't go to the cinema to see lots of films, to be honest. I usually waited for them to come out on the VHS, but I do remember going to see that, and I just remember being kind of in awe. I was a little bit disappointed with the gun barrel, if I'm honest with you, because they changed the music slightly. Um, and I was, you know, having watched all the old Bond films, I was thinking, I'm not sure they do that. But in terms of the overall look, I think, even though I mentioned it before, Roger's my favourite Bond. In terms of the look, though, I can't think of anyone else who could actually look better as James Bond than Pierce Brosnan. He just looks the part. But yeah, what did you think of uh, Goldeneye? Um, it was a huge sigh of relief. Um, License, this might sound like sacrilege, but License to Kill is one of the very, very few films I've actually left the cinema before the end of it because I was so bored. <laughs> Seriously. No. I, thought, I thought License to Kill was, I've, I've, the old adage of, it's like watching paint dry, watching paint dry was more interesting. And mm -hmm. I've tried watching it, I've tried watching it again recently when Xander sat watching all the Bond films and it hasn't improved with age. My favourite bit Sorry, again, sacrilege, really. But my favourite bit of watching <laughs> Licence to Kill in the cinema was, you know, where Q turns up and he's done, like dressed like a road to or a gardener or something? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Guys, at that bit, I said in a very, very loud voice, it is I, Leclerc. <laughs> <laughs> the whole cinema bellowed with laughter. And that was my favourite part of the film. But no, uh, Goldeneye, I'm the reverse for you. I usually go to the cinema. I didn't see Goldeneye in the cinema because of the license to kill experience. Then a lot of my friends were saying, you've got to see Golden Knight, it's fantastic, it's fantastic. We went to Cavern Records as it was in London and then hired the VHS. Younger people won't know what that means, but we hired the VHS, yeah, and the biggest sigh of relief because James Bond was back for me. Pierce Brosnan had all the bits that made Roger Moore so fantastic, but with a modern twist on him. Judy Dench's M, you know, absolutely brilliant um, and the way she takes him down saying you're a sexist misogynist dying sort of relic from the cold war it's like the producers know this is a new age and things aren't like they were before and but james bond is the same character it's always like the square peg fits into the round hole of the modern era but brosnan just took the ball ran with it and he absolutely rocked yeah yeah and to be honest the bond franchise owes pierce brosnan an awful lot because if it hadn't been pierce brosnan and maybe someone else, and it didn't go as well, we wouldn't be watching Daniel Craig now. Although, to be fair, that might have been for the best. <laughs> but moving on, moving on. So, uh, yeah, Goldeneye, do you know where that name comes from? Isn't it um, Ian Fleming's house or something? Yeah, it's one, his, of, one of his houses. Making home, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, trying to find, as I do every week with this, because, of course, the Bond Doctor Who connection. Um, what is the connection, Ed, do we know, between... Goldeneye and Doctor Who. Goldeneye and Doctor Who, right. Is it Alan Cumming? Alan Cumming was in Goldeneye and he also played King James in Jodie Whittaker's first series. Well, Ed, well done. Not the one I was thinking of, actually. Ah. <laughs> so, a bit more direct than that, actually. Okay. You've got, for Goldeneye, there was Piers Brosnan running, Liam Neeson, who turned it down, I think Liam Neeson was probably the first choice, actually. Ironically, rumoured to have turned it down because he didn't want to do action films. 
And yeah, that's really what's revived things for him afterwards. But there we are. So we also had Sean B in the running, who obviously got 006 in the end. And at one point, it was rumoured that had, and he, well, he, he did audition for it, that is confirmed. And it's rumoured if Fierce Brosnan had turned it down, Paul McGann would have been bombed. Oh, that's interesting. That's something I didn't know. Oh, okay. I can't quite see him as Bond at all. Yeah, he doesn't have a Bondish look about him like some actors do, but I'm sure they'd have made it work. Yeah, no, they, they would have. Well, there was a one, one chap who was in the frame who didn't get it um, called the Mark Frankel. Um, I know the thing is, if we, this isn't, it's just an audio one, but if, if guys, if you go and look, Google him, um, yeah, he, he looked good. He would have been good. Unfortunately, though, he died. Um, I think he was in a car crash or, so, or some accident anyway, sort of within, in 19, something like 96, uh, which is just, just tragic, but um, had things turned out differently, you know, parallel universal, he, he would have been really good. He would have been good, I'm sure. Um, so I'm going to go through some little facts here as well for our listeners. So okay. uh, sort of, uh, things like that. So the BMW Z3, what do you think about the BMW Z3? It's very nice. Anything particular about it, Ed? I don't um, know. I'm not no, in a while. No, no. no. And to be honest, to be fair, I'm throwing all these things at Ed. I've not prepped them at all for any of this. Um, no, actually, the BMW Z3 is probably one of the only Bond cars that doesn't actually do anything. If you think about the film, it doesn't do anything at all. Oh, it hasn't got the gadgets. No. BMW, agile five forward gears, all points radar. Self-destruct system, and naturally, all the usual refinements. And um, essentially that was because, well, BMW struck the deal quite late on, um, and, subs- and also because it's a prototype, BMW kind of, it was, it was really early stages. I think they just kind of gave them the car as a shell. It was like, okay, we'll do the deal with you. Here's the car. Um, but don't mess about with it. Just literally just show it on the screen, guys. Um, because it, I think what happened subsequently was that people putting orders in, I think they were waiting. Well, I know one guy who got a BMW Z3. Um, I think he had to wait 12 months for it after that. That was just, you know, so worked for BMW, obviously. But yeah, yeah. Z3 didn't do very much. Trying to think about little things, whoever, who else was in the offering for different roles. Oh, this is an interesting one. Is Xenia on the top? Oh, what's the actor's name? Oh, uh, Fanke Jansen. Fanke Jansen, yeah. Yeah. Um, apparently, Courtney Cox could have got that one. I can see that one. Now you said it, I can see that. They've got facially quite similar. Yeah, so that, that could have been an interesting one. Um, I'm just trying to think about other little things about GoldenEye before we move on to uh, tomorrow never dies. Uh, well, there's a yeah, there's a few pictures. Uh, Roger visited the set actually whilst they're doing that, but that was because Roger's son was a uh, like a I don't want to say cameraman, a director, some sort of assistant director on GoldenEye. Um, but apparently, it, apparently, when Roger turned up on the set, apart from everyone being like, "Oh, it's Roger Moore, fantastic." Um, <laughs> Apparently, I think he joked and said, you know, they've, they've called me back. <laughs> so, he's, he's not in it as an extra. He's not in a crowd scene or something. Not to the best of my knowledge. Oh, so. That would be fantastic. A lovely uh, I think he was called, I'm pretty sure, I've seen the photo of him and Pierce Brosnan together. And I'm pretty sure it's where they were filming the tank chase, you know, the um, yeah. wherever that was. So maybe we should watch that really one day in super slow motion. Yeah, we might find that Roger Moore walking down the street or something like that. So you never know. You never know. So I'm just going to move on to... Sorry, go on, Ed. You're going to say Yeah, I was going to say about GoldenEye as well. Interestingly, um, it introduces Robbie Coltrane's character. Our next KGB guy. Tough mother. Got a limp on his right leg. Named Sukovsky. Valentin Dmitrovich Sukovsky? Yeah. You know him? I gave him the limp. You don't yeah. get that many recurring characters. I mean, you've got Felix Leitner, um, you, you know, but not many recurring characters. And he was really, say, apart from the main ones, like Felix and M and Money Penny, he was the only really recurring character I can think of in the Bond franchise. 
yeah you've got well actually yeah you've got that and then also you've got interestingly you've got um jack wade as well wasn't jack wade uh, oh the cop yeah the american cia yeah. agent yeah. yeah he he was in wasn't he into his character i mean the the chap who plays him don baker he was he was uh, in joe yeah. don baker even sorry joe uh, don baker yeah because i suppose that's from a continuity viewpoint he was also in the living daylights but he's a bad he was the villain he was yeah. the arms dealer, wasn't he yeah, yeah 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 there's only i think there's only been a few hang on just trying to think who else has done that as well charles gray did it charles gray was in one of sean's earlier films um oh and then, you live twice. yeah that's yeah, right yeah, yeah. and and then he was in diamonds of forever wasn't he because blue film and then you've got the chap, General Gogol. Yeah, um, yeah, he's a recurring character, wasn't he, for quite a while? Yeah, but he was also in, um, he was in um, From Russia With Love, yeah? Yes. But not as that character. So there's been a few actors that have kind of, I was going to say reprised roles, totally opposite of that, actually. Um, but they've, they've been in multiple films, but there's different characters. I suppose the most famous would be Maud Adams, wouldn't it? Yes, who we've... Yeah. Who, who, who have, well, I, I'm wondering if we've mentioned it before. It might have. Hit, well, I know we've discussed it before, but it might have hit the editing. It might have hit the uh, editor's floor. I don't know. Yeah, she's done two. Rumored to be three, in actual fact, because there was a cameo in a Bond film, which I still can't confirm. <laughs> but she, we, we we know the two she was on the screen, but she was an extra in one other one. And um, so yeah, we'll, we'll talk about one again. Now, I'm just thinking, tomorrow never dies. Uh, go on to that. I actually watched that this week, actually. Um, not in necessarily preparation for this, but just because it was like, I haven't watched many of Pierce Brosnan's films recently. Um, and I thought, yeah, I'll go with that one. Yeah, it was, it was okay. I'll be honest, sorry, Pierce, it, GoldenEye was probably as good as it got. Um, I think there's like snippets in all of his films, which I absolutely love. But I think Golden Eyes is most his first out is his perfect outing and his perfect bond. Tomorrow Never Dies, I like it. Got some great scenes in there. Got some great tracks as well. Um, the, the soundtrack was David Arnold. Uh, that's both it, yeah. And David Arnold. Um, there's two. Well, there's two trains of thought. But David, to, to quote David Arnold himself and what he believes is true, is that he did. I don't know if you've ever seen it. He did, um, or heard it, I should say, a CD, the David Arnold Project, where he basically... Did... Oh, he remixed all the Bond tracks? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah really good. There was one on there, which it was the on the, the one that he did with Propel Head, which was the on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Yeah. And they when they were filming um, Tomorrow Never Dies, at that point they hadn't got a composer, but they'd done the filming. There's a scene which... Is the one where the he's he's driving the BMW with remote control, yeah, yeah, and um, with the with the phone on the remote, control. and they use that track, oh, or just as as part of the edit, just to get a feel for it, and they they liked it so much um, that they kind of got him on board, and uh, he went from that to being the composer. So yeah, shows how these things can evolve. Yeah, yes, now, I mean. For me Tomorrow Never Dies for me. Um, I did see it in the cinema. I remember seeing it in the cinema. Um, and plot-wise, it's incredibly similar to The Spy Who Loved Me and um, You Only Live Twice. You know, you've got a third party trying to cause a world war for their own reasons in there. Um, I wasn't a massive fan of it at the time, but on my recent rewatch, it's gone up in my estimation. It's yeah. not half... It's, it's not... I don't think it's... Pierce Brosnan's best, but I don't think it's his worst either. And it's, it's, it's better than a lot that's come since. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that. But yeah. no, it's a nice, exciting Bond film that feels like it does everything a Bond film should do. It feels like a Bond film. So David Arnold's music is superb. It really gives you that, that feel. Um, but yeah, not bad at all. Bit of a retread. I mean, I like, um, oh, what's his name? Local fella. Welsh guy. Oh, the villain. What's his name? Oh, Jonathan Price. Jonathan Price, yes. Uh, yeah, from Hollywell. Is he? He's from Hollywell. Oh, yeah. he, well, yeah, interestingly and... enough, he, he hadn't even been... You know, when they when they went to... When they actually started filming on the film, yeah. he hadn't even been cast. 
in fact, he, the, the regional person that was cast, but walked out after about two days, again, you're like this, another Welsh, it was Anthony Hopkins. Oh, interesting. Yeah, he, he was originally going to be that character. And yet that, char- that character, Elliot Carver, has got one bit of trivia, which is quite interesting, actually. What is different about Elliot Carver, Ed? I, I don't expect you to get this, really, to be fair, but... What is different about Elliot Carver? Yeah. As a Bond villain, what is different yeah. about Elliot Carver than any other Bond villain? Is it that the, he didn't really want to take over the world, he just wanted to write some news headlines? No. Um, no. To be fair, you would, you would never get it, really. If you got it, it would be like, where did you pull that one out of the bag from? <laughs> he is the only character, he's the only Bond villain to have ever been married. Like, to be fair, though, <laughs> I don't think he loved his wife that much because he, he managed to get her killed within about 45 minutes. That was Teddy Hatch's character, wasn't it? Tell me, James, do you still sleep with a gun under your I think we should set an appointment for my wife with the doctor. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying yeah. to think who was supposed to get Terry Hatcher's role. There's somebody else that was supposed to be playing instead of Terry Hatcher, but it might come back to me. If it doesn't, not to worry. But yeah, a um, little bit of trivia there. So we went, yeah, I mentioned before about the, the, the Z3, but actually, again, BMW managed to get the contract for Tomorrow Never Dies. And um, Really nitpicky trivia, but um, actually, the BMW Z50 is it? I think it is. Um, yes. it, it's the only Bond car to have ever had four doors. Your new BMW 750, all the usual refinements machine guns, rockets, the GPS tracking system. Welcome. Please fasten seatbelt and obey all instructions for a safe trip. Thought you'd pay more attention to a female voice. I think we've met. Or well, five doors, you'll be ten. Yeah, it did. was more like a saloon car, wasn't it, than a sports car? But, you know, we, we wouldn't turn it down. Not if we could drive it by control. If I could drive it with an old 90s Sony Ericsson film like him as well, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> I, it, it, Bond is just perfect at everything, isn't he? He, he just gets given that remote, that remote control car, literally two seconds, and he's just driving it around, and he finishes about a foot away or less than that from the queue. Yeah. Or Q. Moving on. The world is not enough. The world is not enough. Now, this has got to be one of my favourite pre-title sequences, but it's also like the longest pre-title sequence. I think it's about 14 minutes. And that's mainly because the pre-title was meant to finish. You know the bit where, um, so it starts off, isn't it? He's at the bank. The, um, the gun, the of- yeah, the gun explodes and then he... Yeah. It has to smash the window and jump out the window, yeah? Yeah. Uh, that's where the pre-title was meant to finish, of him j- jumping out the window. But when they did it, with t- when they showed it to test audiences, they, it was a bit, it, they felt it was too, too weak a finish to go into okay. a final sequence. So then the next bit, which was to do with the boat chase, which was supposed to be after the pre-title sequence had to be brought forward and sort of blended into it. Um, so that's where that came from. But as a result, you end up with the, like, I think it's another nine or ten minute, well, probably nine minute boat chase. But I think it, I think that was the right decision, though. It's, it is a long pre-title, but it, it, it's a good one. Yeah, it really sets the tone, doesn't it? Yeah. And Pierce Brosnan, he, you know, he's looked, he was, had a bit of input there. I like it when the cue boat dives under the water, and as it's diving under the water, he adjusts his tie. And then you go. Yeah, yeah so a nice little callback. So I did it with the tank in Goldeneye. Yeah, he, yeah. He had a couple of little trademarks. He, he used to like just in his tight. And the other one, which um, I know some people have taken the Mickey out of, is his. He's got every film. You've got to have the Pierce Brosnan run. He's got like a very little distinctive run, and he's trying. Oh, okay. To- yeah. You watch his films now. There's, there's somewhere yeah. you will always guarantee that he gets a run in there. He loves, he loves running around the set. <laughs> but um, what I'm just trying to think as well. Uh, a little trivia for the listeners. Oh, Sean, Con- a bit like Golden Eye when Roger turned up. Sean Connery actually turned up on the world is not enough. Um, 
and it was on the day that they were filming. Do you remember in, in, in the film, there's a scene where he's, he's like in underground and he, he's holding on to these chains. Yeah. And there's a, yeah. uh, there's like a blast. And so he's, he's riding on these trains and there's the flames that are coming behind him. At the end, I mean, Sean Connery didn't say anything um, during the, obviously he was waiting for it. And then as soon as he said cut, apparently he said to Pierce Brosnan, are you sure they're paying you enough? <laughs> <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> oh, very good. Yeah. So, uh, but I, I think a good film. I don't. I I like Denise Rich. She's she's very nice. Very nice. I'm not sure. She, I'm not sure though. It kind of worked really because Denise Rich had done you know things like Wild Things. She was kind of very famous. I don't know. I don't know. It just didn't seem to quite work as well. I think maybe it's the same with Halle Berry. I, I, I prefer it when you don't necessarily know the Bond girls, you know, and then it's actually the Bond film that makes them famous, maybe, you know. Well, were you saying before that Goldeneye was your peak Brosnan? World is Not Enough is my peak Brosnan. Absolutely love it. Um, again, it's one I saw in the cinema. Um, I remember the evening I went to go and see it in the cinema. I only just passed my driving test. And yeah, drove to cinema with a car full of friends to see it. And it's one of those ones, the, the long title sequence, it just made it up, the, it up the stakes and up the stakes and up the stakes. And then, I mean, we're not going to give any spoilers because I'm sure everyone who's listening to this has seen it anyway. But the reveal that Sophie Marceau's character was actually the villain in league with Renard blew me away. I, I couldn't quite believe that. It's really, really, really clever twist. And, you know, him being a, he was a, I thought that, um, Robert Carlyle as Renard was a Bond villain in the classic sense of it. He had some sort of gimmick to him that he, that he couldn't feel pain, but there was this bullet going, was it a bullet going further and further into his brain and one day it'll kill him. But all his pain, his sense of pain has gone completely. And then, you know, it's, yeah, absolutely loved it. So you've got the brilliant title sequence, you've got the bit in the snow, you've got the bit in the desert, you've got the base, you've got, you know, for the for purposes of the joke at the end, we know now why um, Denise Richards' character is called Christmas Jones. I thought Christmas only comes once a year. Basically, for, for the purpose of the joke at the end, <laughs> but it's got everything. <laughs> that, it, it's just for me, it's a classic Bond film that, you know, Rog could have been in it. It's got that sort of feel of a 70s epic, so like The Spy Who Loved Me or Moonraker. So absolutely love it. And even, even the band at the time, I was really into Garbage, the band at the time, so the fact that they got the gig of the of the title music again, absolutely fantastic. So loved it. Yeah, I, I think you're spot on there actually. When I, when you when you word it like that, that is a very compelling argument. I might have to revisit it actually. Mm, you might be right there, Ed. You might be right. Golden. Oh, Mike, I don't know. Oh, well, I put it on a okay. I'll put it on a par. I'll give you that. Ed. I'll give you that. You you argued that very well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> So I don't have too much more to say about the world is not enough. Is um, Diana the Day? Who, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of fans that don't like Diana the Day. I, I think it. Roger Moore's not had very, very good things to say about it, really, which is unusual for Roger because he doesn't really get involved. Yeah. But I think he was asked particularly about the gadgets, and I don't think he was very approving of the um disappearing car but <laughs> in that context I think it's probably been taken out of context I think Roger Moore probably enjoyed the film but it just he just thought that was a gadget too far maybe yeah um, although based on fact apparently but there we are um, apparently they use it on uh, it was a prototype uh, I don't know Secret Service stuff who would know but we would, uh, wouldn't know apparently they try and use that sort of stuff reportedly on, mm. on planes, um, because actually, yeah. it, on a plane, potentially it works, apparently. But I suppose if you think about it, it kind of potentially would because you're surrounded by sky, which is colourless. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So, but of course, we could be completely wrong. It could be a f- fiction. We we don't know. We don't know. We don't, we don't, don't know. know. Don't know. Um, don't know. I, I watched it on Saturday night. Um, because it's the Bond film I've seen least. I saw it once in the cinema, and apart from The Invisible Car, I couldn't remember a single thing about it. 
And I watched it on Saturday night. And yeah, I would have to say it is Pierce Brosnan's weakest. It, but it's, it, it's almost like a Bond greatest hits. It's sort of Bond by the numbers. So you've, you've got the Caribbean location, you've got the snow location, you've got the base, you've got the villain with the silly plan. You've got, I mean, Hadley Bay hasn't got a silly name, but she's, her walking out of the sea is very reminiscent of um, Honey Rider in Doctor No, and also flash forwards how Daniel Craig will be introduced in Casino Royale. Um, yeah, you've got, you've got the gadgets. You've, yeah, it, it, it does everything you expect a Bond film to do. It hits all the Bond beats, but there's something, maybe it's too long. It could be too long. Um, and you think you've had two films in a row now where the glamorous woman suddenly turns out to be the traitor. You know, it's yeah. it's maybe a bit too familiar after three films that which are which are taking the franchise from you know creative load to being up there again. This one was a bit of a almost a step back, or maybe a little bit too safe and too much. How do you make a Bond film? Let's just pick these things out of a hat. Yeah, Bond does this, Bond does this, Bond does this, and stitch them together. Not a bad film by any means, just a bit safe, a bit dull. Little trivia about it. I don't know much trivia about it today, really. Well, actually, the, I tell you what, there's what Die Another Day and uh, On a Majesty Secret Service. What's the connection? Again, I'm just facing them. You know, what, what, day... what, what do you see? Okay, let's put it a different way, listeners. What do you see in Die Another Day that you see in On a Majesty Secret Service? And it's the only two times, well, up until that point. Oh, is it a cargo on ice? No, 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 no. It's the when where you see it's only two times. I th- I can't think. I can't think of another time you see it where you see James Bond's office. Oh, okay. So you see it in you see it in on a Majesty's Secret Service. You do, yeah, because he, he goes at Disney. All those little things like he opens his drawer and there's Honey Rider's little gun or this little yes. Rider's knife. You know, all there to try and. Rem, reminisce and sort of hand over the the mantle, isn't it? Yeah, and yeah. then you see it, albeit it's kind of fictitious, in Dying of the Day when he's, you know, when he's doing in the visit virtual reality, virtual reality simulation. Yes, yes, yeah. Anyway, bit of a boring mm. trivia, but nonetheless, no, it's trivia. still trivia. We like trivia. So I think I think we can say, and this would be bored out really by Prime, Amazon Prime, that. Chris Brosnan did a pretty good job, really. He did. Yeah. Fantastic. I, I yeah. don't think... I mean, I'm not sure if I was being critical, which is... I mean, I just love all his films anyway. But I heard, if I was being uber critical, OK, it's not my favourite in the sense of, we know that's kind of Roger and somewhere between Roger and Tim. Um, but I think he absolutely 100% looks the part he just looks perfect. Um, there's not maybe dying of the day, but the new resoutings are so bad that you can't watch them. He's done, no. like, he's done no. two fucking ones. We've got Golden Eye and The World Is Not Enough, yeah. which might be even equally as good now that you've argued that point, Ed. Um, so that, you know he's got a decent fifty percent success rate there, which is better than some of the some. Yeah, you know he's doing he's doing well. You know, and Die Another Day and Tomorrow Never Dies, they're not bad films by any means. It, you know, Tomorrow Never Dies, yeah, it's really, really good. It's just, it came after GoldenEye. So anything, it's, it's you know, it's like anything when you've got something amazing and then something not quite as good, but still great comes after it. It, it obviously, unfortunately gets compared unfavourably to it. And the, the biggest crime of, I think, as I said before, of, that, of Die Another Day is it's just a little bit too cosy and a bit too familiar. But, you know, Undoubtedly a Bond film. Yeah, totally. Shame we didn't get another one. Didn't get another one in. That, I was going to do my next question now, because I don't know a lot about what happened when Pierce Brosnan left the role or lost the role. What actually happened there? <laughs> I was wondering why the door closed on me. I thought, I thought, <laughs> Thing. I thought I don't everything need... was going so well. <laughs> you know, come back. They said come back. And yeah. Then... All right. There you go. We won't talk about that. It's a cruel mm. business. It's, it's always it been really a cruel business. business. Mm-hmm. All right, I want to... But I just, I, I think because there was quite a few gadgets in Dying of the Day. Yes. Um, it generally speaking, it was kind of, 
it was planned a little bit, I think, yeah. And it was a case of they didn't have to renew. I think Pierce Brosnan had done his films, if you see what I mean. There wasn't a contractual agreement and they just decided that might be time to take in a different direction, maybe. Um, but there was rumours at one point, um, which would have been very different, that they, they were thinking about, you know, there was rumours that Tarantino was going to direct a Bond film with, with Pierce Brosnan. Mm. Well, that would have been interesting. Do you know what, though? I think if you're going to do that, if Tarantino was going to direct a Bond film, I feel in a way it'd almost have to be standalone from the franchise in many ways. Yeah. You see what I mean? As in, I think you could legitimately bring in a totally different actor, not the current James Bond, just for a one-off, just because it would just be a totally different take on Bond. It would yeah, be like, a very ruthless take on Bond, I would imagine. Very much so, yes. So I, yeah. I think there's part of me that would quite like to see it because I think it would be very interesting, but I wouldn't want it as part of the ongoing franchise. It would just be literally a standalone film. Even so like, if, like a, even like a spin-off even would be yeah, yeah I just because I just don't see it fitting in with the films. Sequence. Or letting him, have, letting him have a crack at redoing Never Say Never Again or something. That type of thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just give just give him a like so in which he, you know, yeah, you can do what you want. But this is a one off and we're we're not even gonna give you the current bond actually. We're not gonna give yeah. you Brock, we're not gonna give you Craig, we're not you can cast and just do what you want. And then mm-hmm. obviously it's a standalone film in its own right. That that's yeah. how I if that was gonna happen, that's how I think it should be. Mm-hmm. So I think we you know, I think that probably covers for the moment Pierce Brosnan. We'll probably, yeah. you know, come back to him at a game at some point in the future. Um, so thanks for talking to me about that Ed. now a little feature um, I've not really ever I've not covered this off with you prior to this Ed so this is a surprise I'm going to pro- I'm going to play a sound bite now and I want the listeners to try and guess who this is because this person will be the topic for a future podcast I'm going to play it and see if you can work out who it is Ed okay um, so ready here we go. Yes, that's true. I was, I've was i been typecast. Uh, I wouldn't say I couldn't do another job. I've yeah. done several stage plays and various other things, you know. And um, I even had to get out of the country and go to Australia. Typecast and a rather, well, marvellous piece of work. I mean, there's no other word for it. Brilliant. The writers are brilliant. And this is on a level that, uh, and to be snobbish, which is far and above the average kind of soap opera. And that's the killer. If you're stuck in the type of soap opera with a mechanical character, each week, uh, which means that you don't get a chance to change. Mm. You see, um, the worst thing you can hear from an actor is, my character wouldn't do this. Then he's finished. That means his character is tight and narrow like that. One week I will depend, be defending a sort of a, a, a socialist principle. And the next week I will be attacking the same socialist principle because human nature is like that, very contradictory. So, Ed, any thoughts? So, so the first thought was it had H. Corbett, but it's not. And he said soap, and he has to leave the country. So it's a soap character who's done something controversial or been a controversial character. I'll be honest, Ed. Is it? No, no, no. I, Ed, I can't, I can't let you go on this merry little dance. You hit okay. it. You hit the nail on the head. That was Harry H. Corbett. Was it Harry H. Corbett? It was. It was. Interesting. Wow. And we'll 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 play we'll play the snippet again in the future. He then goes on to talk about uh, inflation and how life is so difficult. Doesn't the thing is well, just in circles? <laughs> so, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Yeah, absolutely. So he will be a one of the features in an upcoming podcast. But I say him uh, more so Steptoe and Son. Um, I'd like to cover that off if that's okay with yourself. And can I just add a little aside to that? Um, the play, Steptoe and, the Steptoe and Son play with um, Jason Isaacs and is Phil Davis. Yeah, The Curse of Steptoe. The Curse of Steptoe. If I was in charge of James Bond, when Pros- Brosnan left, Jason Isaacs would have been my first and last choice for Bond and I'd have paid him anything to do it. 
because he looks like Bond. Yeah, he, he would have been. He would have actually been a very, very good Bond. I think that I was. Think, I always think of him as the best Bond we never had, Jason Isaacs. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So um, yeah, we're going to do that one. Um, I don't know when it will be because we're just kind of we've, we've got lots of things that we're, we're, we've got lots of plates that we're spinning on. We had we've it's spinning on a lot of plates, yes. A, a lot of things that could happen in the not too distant future. And I'm right outside my comfort zone on some of them, but I'm learning. Um, and so in that sense, yeah, guys, even though we, we've actually broadened our horizons, obviously from we're talking at the moment, we've only just gone, um, we've only ever done Bond and Doctor Who. <laughs> I haven't said that, we're only four episodes in. But we are going to broaden that um, to just the entertainment in general. And we've got some fantastic things lined up potentially. Um, I say potentially because until they're recorded and edited, um, they're not in the can. But I'm sure it's all going to come to fruition. But what it might mean is that we, um, the, the, the episodes that we do go out of sequence a little bit because we've got some things lined up. But if then somebody says they can drop tools and record it next week, that's what will happen. So uh, there we are. We did say in the last one that we were going to go off topic. So next week we are recording and we will be discussing... What are we going to be discussing? Ed? We're going to be discussing the Ghostbusters franchise in all its glory. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward to that, actually. I'm going to have to go back and refresh my memory on some of it a little bit. Um, and there's far worse things you could be doing than watching the Ghostbusters film. So really looking forward to it. And I know that you are, Ed. So that's for next week. But for now, that is goodbye from me, Ash, and goodbye from Ed. Goodbye. And uh, we have been Bowties of Sunshine's Cool. Please like and subscribe and uh, listen to us next week. Take care. See you now.